Are you feeling okay? Let's pray. Let's stand up. So stretch a little bit. And uh, I love the meditation, but it's a little difficult to come in and try to talk and have enthusiasm when everybody's like zoned out. <laughs> so uh, it's better to come back to this world, this dimension too, right? So let's just lift our hands up. We'll pray. Father, bless uh, our time together. We just thank you for your, the presence and the power of your spirit. Just ask you to anoint me to bring forth light and truth and love in Jesus' name. Amen. And be seated. Uh, I want to start in Hebrews and talk about, I want to continue to talk about um, changing, shifting our reality, creating new timelines. Uh, and I want to look in Hebrews chapter 11, a very familiar verse, but just kind of look at it maybe from a different perspective. Hebrews 11 verse 1 says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for. Everybody say substance. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So things. <laughs> and it says, for by it the elders obtained a good testimony. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. So notice how many times the word thing is used there. And he talks about things seen and things unseen, right? Things that are uh, part of this physical reality. And then, but he also calls faith a substance. Everybody just say substance. Uh, so substance is also something that is tangible. And by the way, substance is the best translation. Well, the closest, I don't know if it's the best. I think somebody could do a better job. But uh, I dug into this word for like a year <laughs> in the Greek, trying to understand it, reading everything I could about it. Um, substance comes the closest to the original Greek word, which is hypostasis. And if you were here a few years ago, I did a whole long series on just that word hypostasis. <clears throat> now, we have problems in our modern English translations because a lot of other translations will say it is the assurance or confidence giving you this idea that it's a mental thing, that faith is a mental thing. And that translation comes directly from Martin Luther, who comments in his journals that his conscience afflicted him <laughs> for that translation because he knowingly changed the meaning from what the Greek actually meant into a different word to fit the context of his own theology of justification by faith. And so now we're afflicted with these translations that say faith is the assurance or the confidence or whatever the case may be, right? So people have a general idea here that when they, if they, if they think faith has anything to do with changing outcomes, right? Anything to do with changing your experience or changing the potential of a future experience. Because a lot of people don't even believe that anymore in Christian circles and whatever and that study the Bible. But for those that do believe that faith can change an outcome, generally what they end up doing is believing that if they can believe hard enough that God is going to do something, then it will happen. <laughs> if I can be persuaded that God is going to do something, then that will happen. Um, and there's a little bit of... of uh, confusion then between hope and faith. And then here's the really sad thing. It doesn't work. Or, or sometimes it does. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it does. Sometimes you roll a seven. <laughs> sometimes you don't. <laughs> a blind squirrel can find a nut and a dead clock is right twice a day. Yeah, I had to give a minute for that to sink in. <laughs> A dead clock is right twice a day. <laughs> Unless it's digital, and I guess, and then it's only right once a day, but, and it's probably blinking. But anyway, back to the text. He, he draws a definite distinction between faith and hope. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's not hope itself. So what is hope? Hope is always about the future. It's always about something that you don't have. In fact, in the book of Romans chapter 8, Paul says that a person does not hope for that which they already possess. So if you already have it, you can't hope for it. <laughs> Right? So believing that something is going to happen, and actually in the Greek, the word hope means a confident expectation. It actually means believing that something is going to happen. 
So Hebrews is telling us right here that faith is distinct from that or separate from that. So therefore, faith cannot be at least real biblical faith that actually works or something that, that, yeah, that actually works. It cannot be hoping for or, or believing that something is going to happen, having a confident expectation that something is going to happen because that's what hope is. And faith is the substance of things hoped for. So I like that the translation also says now faith is because in order for it to be real faith, it has to exist in present tense reality. Hope always exists in the future. You don't hope for what you already have. Hope always exists in the future, but faith always exists in the present moment. It's in the now. So it is something that you possess now that is the actual original substance, or let's put it this way, the creative substance of that which you are hoping for. So without faith, there is no way to connect your timeline, your, uh, your future hope to your present timeline. There's no way to connect yourself to it because you are in the now. <laughs> always. You're always in a now moment. Make sense? Then he gives us further understanding because he says, by faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which were seen were not made of things which are visible. So coming back to the word substance, in the Greek it is hypostasis. Hypostasis. What does that sound like if, if, in English? Thank you. Homeostasis, right? So homeostasis is what? It's your body being in a... In a state or standing of sort of harmony, right? Health and well-being. Hypostasis, the hypo means to be behind or beneath or underneath. So in other words, what it's saying is, is there is a invisible reality that stands behind or underneath what you can see that holds it in a place of stability. There is an invisible reality, a substance. The Greeks believed it was a literal substance. They believed that it was the ether, the, the aether, the, yeah. Unless you know what that is, that doesn't help you. Um, they believed it was a real invisible substance that was be behind the world of form in which we live that maintained the order and the stability of our current reality. So in this sense, the worlds were framed, held together by the word of God. Now, we know from John's gospel that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and all things were made by Him, and without Him nothing was made that has been made. And in Him was life, and the life was light of man, and all that, right? So in the beginning was the Word, and the Word is the origin of all things. But the Greek word that's being used by John is the word logos. The word that's used here in Hebrews is the word rhema. Totally different word. Logos, you can think of like logic. It corresponds pretty well to that English word. So there's this divine logic. There's this, the mind of God is basically what the logos is. But rhema typically refers to the thing said or specifically the sound. So by faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the sound of God. So that the things which are seen were not made of things which were visible. So God takes this invisible substance of faith, if you will, and he releases his word or his sound that then brings a pattern, a vibrational pattern that brings order to the things that you see and stability to the reality in which you find yourself experiencing. Does that make sense? Yes. So really, <laughs> to use a modern idea here, what, what the writer of Hebrews is telling us is that we can hack reality. 
Again, to use a, another illustration, if you're, and I've used this several times before, if you're playing a video game, you exist in a world, correct? World of Warcraft or world of whatever, Zelda or uh, Elijah's playing Hello Neighbor now, and, which is a horrible game. <laughs> I hope he's not learning how to treat his neighbor by playing Hello Neighbor, I'm just saying. He's throwing rocks at the house and the neighbor's coming out and catching him. And anyway, I'm not even sure what the object of the game is, but I don't know how I got off on that. Oh, video game. So that's a world, right? But behind that world is a programming language that provides stability and structure and rules to the reality of the game you find yourself playing. But if you were able to see the computer language, it looks nothing like the actual world itself. And so if you can think about faith or the word of God or the sound of God as being the computer language, the substance behind what you see, the game that you're playing, then really what the writer of Hebrews is saying is that you can change, you can shift the reality of this seen world by knowing how to participate with the substance out of which the seen world comes from. And that's what faith is. So therefore you can have a hope, but also you have faith or the ability to change the vibrational pattern that is stabilizing your problem reprogram your life so that that new thing that you want to have will come to you. Does that make sense to you? It's also interesting, this word substance, hypostasis, just as a side note, because we love to give Catholics a hard time for believing in transubstantiation. Listen to the language. Substance, transubstantiation, right? So transubstantiation is what? They believe that the, the, the bread and the wine become the, the literal body and blood of Jesus, right? But it, it doesn't taste like flesh and blood. And we get all worked up as protestants protesting that. <clears throat> but because we don't understand the cosmology or the worldview out of which that came. Because the belief is, is that there is a certain vibration there is a certain vibrational pattern, an invisible substance that stands behind every material thing. And so bread is common bread with a certain vibration. Wine is common wine with a certain vibration. But when the priest and the church, because the church participates in the whole mass, when the priest speaks a blessing or makes a certain vibration, over the bread and the wine, then the priest is endued with the power to change the vibration at the level of the hypostasis. So that now it's vibrating as sacred with the essence, the vibration of Christ in the bread and in the cup. So that then when you partake, you're partaking of the essence of the thing which then can change your essence. Okay, just, I don't know why. I always feel the need to, but, but does it help you kind of understand? So it's not cannibalism. <laughs> All right, come with me to Mark's Gospel. Mark chapter 4. So, again, when, when Jesus is teaching on the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven, he's not talking about some place that you get to go to on another planet somewhere or something or in another dimension when you die so much. That, that he's not talking about that. We know this. Because particularly in Mark's gospel, Mark's gospel begins with Jesus preaching, the kingdom of heaven is present. The, the way they would say it, the kingdom of heaven is at 
hand. It's within your reach. It's within your grasp. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent and believe the good news. Now, repent is another horrible translation. Um, it's a Greek word, metanoia. Noia meaning the mind. And meta meaning to go beyond. It means a transformation of consciousness. So watch this. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of heaven is present let your consciousness be transformed to believe the good news that the kingdom is here so that most scholars now believe that what jesus was talking about when he's talking about the kingdom was a state of consciousness that you come from rather than a place that you go to when you die and that what jesus was offering was a transformation of life into the state of consciousness that belongs to god now watch how all this kind of ties together. Because if, if, if everything was created by the mind of God, the consciousness of God, and everything is being held in a certain pattern by the vibration or the sound of God, then to enter into the kingdom of God would be to enter into the consciousness or the mind of God. Thereby giving you the power to hack reality. Make sense? So all the parables, when Jesus is talking about the kingdom, the kingdom, the kingdom, the kingdom, he's talking about the transformation of your own consciousness. If you don't get that, you miss the whole point of the parable and distort actually what Jesus is teaching. So Mark chapter 4 is the parable of the sower, right? And Jesus is teaching in parables. In verse 10, it says, it says, and when he was alone, those around him with the twelve asked him about the parable. And he said to them, to you, it has been given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. But to those who are outside, all things come in parables. So he didn't say this is a mystery. He says this is the key mystery <laughs> to the kingdom of God, to, to unlock it. And then he goes on in verse 13 and he says, do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? In other words, if you don't get this, you're missing the entire foundation of the kingdom and you won't get anything else. And what is it? He says, the sower goes out to sow or a planter goes out to plant, right? He gives you the interpretation in verse 14. The, se the sower sows the word. Logos. So or so is the word. <laughs> These are the ones by the wayside where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan comes immediately and takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. So the field is the heart. Seed is the word. Field is the heart. Now, moving on. I don't want, I could spend forever on this. Verse 26. And he said, the kingdom of God is as a man should scatter seed on the ground. What's the seed, saints? The word. What's the ground? All right. And should sleep by night and rise by day. And the seed should sprout and grow. He himself does not know how. <laughs> For the earth, what's the earth? The heart. Watch this. This will change your whole life. <laughs> the heart yields crops by itself. First the blade, then the head, and after that the full grain in the head. But when the grain ripens immediately, he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. Where does the fruit come out of? Does it come out of outer space? Does it come out of heaven? Does it come out of God? Where does it come out of? It comes out of, your, it comes out of the heart. The heart brings forth the fruit by itself. Why the heart? Because the heart, more than anything else, especially in Hebrew, is the place of consciousness. In another interesting study that I did, like, I'm just being a total Bible nerd today. It's like, who does this kind of weird stuff? <laughs> I looked at every Hebrew word in the Old Testament that talks about the consciousness. And not one time does the Hebrew locate consciousness in the head. 
Not a single time. Emotions can be located in the liver, the kidneys, or the heart. So Jesus is speaking to Hebrews. So the place of consciousness is the place of the heart. But now see, here's the issue. Consciousness itself is the field out of which everything originates. We have this modern idea because, because we've been taught by, by biologists who have a certain prejudice when interpreting reality that your thinking is the byproduct of neural circuitry that happens in the brain and that biology gives rise to thought. So therefore, your thoughts are, your, are yours alone and they're contained within your skull. There's a, there are other neuroscientists, including one of the um, pioneers in brain research. I can't remember his name right now. Ugh, anyway, it'll probably come to me at 3, three in the morning. Um, who believe that the brain is actually a recorder of consciousness and that thought gives rise to the neural, secret circuit, neural circuitry in the brain. So it's kind of the classic question, which comes first, the chicken or the egg, right? There's no way to... Because when you're dealing with something that's immaterial, there's no way to study it in a scientific method because science has to be observed. So you don't know always if you're observing the effect or the cause. Certainly when it comes to the brain. But you've been taught that your, your thinking exists in here, and so therefore it is personal to you. But an ancient worldview and a Hebraic worldview would not be like that. It would be that there is a collective mind or consciousness. You see this reflected in Scripture when the Bible says, be of the same mind, be of the same heart, be of one soul, it even says in one place. So if you could stop thinking about yourself as limited by your body and understand that your consciousness is incredibly expansive. That in fact you have the potential to access anything that exists. That's how big you are. <laughs> so when you are sowing a seed in your heart, what you're doing is you are, you are planting a new thought. Why does a farmer farm? Why does a farmer plant? Grow to grow a crop, right? But they get to choose what they want. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's also planting in anticipation of the future. Or you could call it now, plant, the planting of the seed is now the substance of the harvest that they're hoping for. So just like that farmer plants the seed in the ground, what Jesus is saying is you can plant a thought deep in your own heart that will then... Because it's through your own consciousness that you have access to hack the computer language that's running your reality. <laughs> it's not through somebody else's heart because you are, if you go back to what I did last Sunday, you are the axis mundi. You are the center of the earth <laughs> for you. Right? So when you have a thought, a logos, and you plant it deep inside your heart, watch this, and he sleeps, the farmer sleeps and rises, and the thing springs up and hap the thing happens, but he knows not how, but the heart brings forth fruit of itself. So in other words, your answer is flowing out of you, not out of heaven. Faith is flowing out of you to move the mountain. Faith is floating, flowing out of you. Faith is what's connecting you to your future hope. Not God, not heaven, not something other than you. It's coming out of your heart. So it has to be maintained and nurtured in your heart. 
If you dig up the seed, you're not going to have a harvest. If you don't nurture the seed, you're not going to have a harvest. If you don't weed the seed, you're not going to have a harvest. And this is why so many people don't get something, because they plant a seed and just... uh, It falls by the wayside. It gets no depth of burden. Now go back with this understanding. Now go back and read the parable of the sower. Some seed falls by the wayside and the accuser comes and takes it away. That's what the word Satan means. The accuser comes. Well, how does the accuser come and take it from your heart? Unless the accuser's in your heart. He can't. So therefore, we're not talking, even when we're talking about Satan, we're not talking about an entity that is separate or other than you. (laughs) We're talking about your own, thank you, we're talking about your own propensity to accuse yourself, to deny yourself the better future that you want because you believe you don't deserve it, you believe you can't have it, you're not smart enough, you're not good enough, nothing can ever change because I'm, 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 I'm dwelling in a certain vibration vibration at a certain sound that has given stability to my environment and what I don't realize what I'm in the dark about is that it's my sound it's my participation it is my vibration that is holding in coherence the stability of my reality so I just wake up and keep repeating the same thoughts the same feelings the same language and the same behavior so therefore I keep experiencing the same external outcomes because, because I literally am the sound of God that is holding together the, the rea- my reality. And because this world is built on free will, I get to choose. God told the Israelites, I set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, you choose which one you're going to have. So by the law of free will, I am the sound of God. I am the axis mundi, the center of my own world, the temple of God, who gives the sound or the vibration that is the substance that is standing behind every experience that I have. And so if my reality, if my timeline, if you will, is stabilized, it's because I'm the one stabilizing it. So the only way to change it is to change the vibration. And the only way to change the vibration is to plant a seed. And the only way to plant a seed is to plant a new thought. A new thought, a new idea about a new reality that I can experience. A new belief that gets sown inside my heart. But what can happen is the accuser inside of me can say, you don't deserve that. You can't have that. You're not smart enough for that. You can't afford that. Whatever the case may be. And, and, and if I surrender to that sound, the new sound gets gobbled up. And it won't produce fruit. And then I'll blame God. I'll accuse God. I'll become a Satan, just like Peter, I'll become a Satan to God. Because Jesus told Peter, get behind me, Satan. He wasn't speaking to an entity other than Peter. I know that's hard for people to get because they they have to take total responsibility. (laughs) We don't like that for some reason. Then he goes on and he says, he says, I'm doing the parable of the sower now. I hope I haven't lost you. (laughs) Then he goes on. He says, some seed falls on stony ground. And it has no depth of earth. In other words, it didn't get deep inside the heart. And it says the sun comes up and it withers because it has no root. Why Why does it wither? It says because persecution and tribulation... Come against you because of the new idea. (laughs) It is true. That's why I don't talk about stuff. Usually, I mean, I crack up because I think people think I just pop stuff off the top of my head or something. Oh, this sounds like a good idea. I usually don't teach stuff that I haven't like marinated for a really long time. Because I know if I open my mouth too soon, (laughs) it's going to shake people up too bad. And I'm going to wither from the persecution and not be able to see it through. So I learned a long time ago. That's why don't go running out and sharing with your friends everything that you hear or every new idea that you have because you're inviting persecution. You're inviting it. And then you're going to blame everybody else that's persecuting you. You're the one that's doing it to yourself. (laughs) Does that make sense to you? 
Or affliction comes. Why? Because you're changing the vibration. You, you don't understand. You are, you are literally, if, again, if I could use the, the idea of a timeline, somewhere, somewhere along the way, you learned to become patterned, to think and to feel and to talk and to act according to a certain sound, according to a certain vibrational pattern. A sound. How many of you, how many of you can relate to I, still hearing your mom's voice in your head? Especially when you do something wrong <laughs> or whatever, right? I've had people tell me, you're, you're the voice in my head. I'm like, oh, Jesus. <laughs> Let's pray for you right now. Let's lay hands like you get delivered. So, so, but that sound governs, right? Governs you at an unconscious level, a subconscious level, sometimes a conscious level. So now you're walking down your timeline and you're being governed by a set way of thinking and feeling and believing and talking and acting. And if you stay on that trajectory, you're going to end up in the future here. If you want to create something else, you've got to be able to see a future that's out here. Then there has to become a decision point where you say, I'm going to have that. The moment you do that, a new timeline branches off. So that at the realm of the unseen, let's do it this way, at the realm of the unseen, you're existing in two potential realities at the same time. The question is, which one is going to stasis or stabilize and which one's going to collapse? And that's the issue. And so what Jesus is teaching in these parables, the mystery of the kingdom, is how to create a new timeline and maintain it until it stabilizes and becomes your experience. You're sowing a seed, if you will. You're putting forth a sound. You're putting forth a vibration in the quantum field. And hoping that it stabilizes until it manifests in the material world. Therefore, we looked at this last week. What things, when you desire, hope for, when you pray, believe that you received it in the past, and you'll have it. Make sense? Now you get to the third type of ground, thorny ground. I should have read the whole thing, I'm trying to save time. I didn't know exactly where this was going. But you know the parable, right? Mm -hmm. The third one is thorny ground. It doesn't bear fruit either. It's choked. Why? Watch this. Satan comes and steals the word. The word doesn't get any depth of earth, so you didn't get it deep, deeply embedded into your consciousness enough. It was just a surface thought, just a fly-by wish. You believed you could have it, but the moment it caused turmoil, why does it cause turmoil? Because one reality is collapsing, so the two realities are fighting against each other. The plant actually needs the sun. <laughs> but if you have no depth inside of you, the sun will kill it. So in other words, you need that destabilization. Otherwise, you're going to end up here where you've been going. That destabilization is actually feeding your dream. But if it's not strong enough inside of you, you'll give up on the dream. The seed will die. That new potential reality will collapse and you'll end up in the same place. Does that make sense? The third ground is the thorny ground. What happens? The thorns grew up and choked. Now, what does that mean? Like choked the life out of the, so it couldn't breathe, right? Choked the word, and it became unfruitful. And what are the cares? Jesus said it's the um, cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the lust for other things. Those are also things that are in us. Those are also states of consciousness. Care, deceit, lust. All of that's a state of consciousness. Lust for other things. 
He, 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 he. What's that place on Main Street? When it says lust for other things, he's not talking about Aloha Glorious. <laughs> It's not necessarily talking about moral lusts that pull you away into immorality. He's not talking about that. Simply the desire to have something else. So I'm not single-minded about this issue. I'm not single-minded about this issue. I become divided because I think, well, maybe I don't want that. Maybe I want this. Maybe I didn't want corn this harvest season. Maybe I want tomatoes. So we dig up the corn seed and try to plant tomato. You get it? The word care actually means to divide the mind. And there's nothing wrong with riches. He didn't say riches. He said the deceitfulness of riches. Because if you want a new timeline, you might have to find a new means of provision. And if you can't leave this reality because, oh my God, I don't know where my paycheck's going to come from. Then the deceitfulness of riches will keep you stuck. But let's talk about this one. Let's talk about care. The cares of this world. And this is where it's really important. I think this is so key. The farmer is able to get a harvest because he does not know how the crop is going to come. He doesn't know how it works. And the how, the process, the steps in your thought life messes you up. Because quite literally, what's supposed to happen when you, when you change, let, let's do it this way. Let's go back to the video game analogy. When you plant the seed, you are rewriting a code in the game. So that when you go back into the game, the reality of it has changed. So the computer language is the unseen substance. The game itself is the scene, the material. Reality, the timeline. You got it? When you get hung up on how, you are still trying to play the game according to the old formatting. Which means you reinforce the consciousness of the old formatting and therefore choke the seed that you planted for the new future. One of the worst things that we can do is obsess and ruminate over how is it going to happen. Take anything. I want this tumor inside my body to shrink. Oh my God, how is it going to happen? I want to increase my income, but I'm stuck at this level, and everybody else I know is kind of stuck at this level. How is it going to happen? Am I going to get a new, how am I going to do this? Am I going to invest? Am I going to get a new job? <laughs> That's caring. That's ruminating. By the way, these concepts that Jesus was teaching was not new to the ancient world. And find these principles go way, way back. And there were methods and technologies that were developed where people would have a moment where they would strongly experience the future that they wanted through the imagination. See it, hear it, but most importantly, Feel it, because here was the key. Strength of emotion was the key to embedding it deeply enough in the heart that it would grow. Or impacting, if you will, the realm of the hypostasis strong enough that your hope would come. That's why faith can only be the substance of things hoped for. 
Because hope is very emotional. Expectation is neutral. Watch this. Fear and worry is also very emotional. You ever notice you don't worry about how your worries are going to happen? You just know they're going <laughs> to. Really? I mean, nobody ever had a worry and sat there and thought, now how's this going to happen? Now how, how, how can I... How can I because the emotional charge on it is very different, right? But the same rules apply. If you're having thoughts charged with a strong emotion of fear or worry, you are sowing that into your future whether you realize it or not. It may not manifest exactly the way you sowed it. Because the same thing's true over here. So it ha faith can only work if it's hope, and hope has to have a strong enough desire, a strong enough emotional oomph to imprint a new reality, to sustain a new timeline. Make sense? So there's an ancient method where they would experience the imagination and then have a supercharged release of emotion. And then there were methods whereby they would forget. Because they would use symbols to represent the thing rather than the thing itself. And if they wanted to nurture the seed, they would focus on the symbol rather than the future. Why would they do that? because it would keep them from obsessing and ruminating over how's it going to happen. Because what's supposed to happen is not that you go out and make it happen, but that a series of synchronicities line up for you so that literally the universe gives it back to you. Just like the ground gives the seed back to the farmer, but it's not in seed form anymore. It's in crop form. Watch this. First the blade, then the ear, then the full corn in the ear. In the same way, you sow it as a thought, but it comes back to you. The universe gives it back to you. How? In a series of synchronicities, coincidences, serendipitous moments. First one, then another, then another, then before you know it, your timeline has stabilized and you're living in the new reality that you were dreaming and faithing for. And you didn't make it happen. And you sit back and think, I never would have put it together like that. Yeah. Why? Because in order to get to this new reality, there has to be a completely different sound a completely different way of thinking. And when you obsess about the how, you're bringing yourself back to the old way of thinking and you keep collapsing the new timeline that's trying to emerge. So you have to be able to let go of controlling the process and go with the flow. Give you this one last little tidbit. Ego tries to exercise force. And ego will never be able to produce results. You don't make the outcome happen when you're in faith. You surrender to the outcome. You don't make it happen. You let it happen. So anytime you're getting too worked up about it, and, oh my God, I'm trying to, and you're tense, and you're in tension, you're trying to make it happen, or like in the old days, you know, spiritual warfare and all this, and, oh, 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 and we're so tense, and just there's all this tension, and uh, it's all ego. It's all fluff. There's no, there's, it's the illusion of power. Real power is when you relax and surrender into it. I can't tell you how many times in a, in a healing line, when I had more time to spend with people for healing, and this is where I'll close, ministering the presence, the power of God, 
and they get so tense and just trying to believe or trying to pray or upset about their problem or whatever and never saw anybody get anything that way ever ever well maybe the blind squirrel that found the nut or the dead clock that was right twice a day but (laughs) there was no consistent results but if I could get the person to relax stop praying stop talking look how tense you are take some deep breaths relax and surrender then the power that was flowing was able to make a connection with them at the point of their need because you don't force it to happen you let it happen (laughs) you don't make it happen you surrender to it you so the, the farmer puts the seed in the ground what does he do he surrenders to the process of nature knowing that the seed will reproduce after its own kind. You can't sow positive seeds for a positive future and get negative results. By the same token, you cannot sow negative seeds and expect a positive future. It just doesn't work that way. God bless you. I hope this offering that I had today was helpful to you and a blessing to you. God bless you. Have a great day.